All right. So I know you guys are thinking about the midterm. I saw a lot of questions on Piazza about midterm questions with midterm problems. I think that's good. Like if you're stuck on a midterm a practice problem and you want to ask about it, you feel free to do that. It's a good way to get your question answered. Uh, we also have office hours today and tomorrow and so on. And there's the layer. Now, in terms of what we're doing this week, uh, I would expect that you guys would focus on midterm study most of this week. Our midterm is on Thursday. There is a homework assignment that's being posted today because we hate you. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, look, we post it in case that people want to work on it, but I would generally not expect you to start on it until after you've done your exam. Um, it's due in the middle of next week. So you could totally focus on the exam right now, finish the exam, then you've got all the coming weekend and the next week into Wednesday to finish. And hey, if that's not enough, you can take a late day. So I, you know, I think you'll have time to focus on each individual test uh, in, in turn. So in terms of what's on the test and all that kind of stuff, that's all posted on the exam section of the webpage. You can look at that when you're ready to look at that. In terms of lectures, I basically think of the midterm as covering up through last Friday and then starting today, I'm not going to explicitly test you on this stuff from these lectures here on the midterm exam. Uh, so <laughs> I guess that might cause you to tune out or, or leave or whatever, but um, you're going to need this material for homework five and ongoing homework and it'll be on the final and all that. So you still need to learn it. So uh, that's the plan, okay? That's the plan. <laughs> Bless you. Okay, so anyway, uh, what we're going to do today is we've been learning a lot about linked lists. We also learned last Monday about how to implement a collection using an array. We made a collection called Array Stack. And uh, I want to revisit all of that stuff again today. The theme of today is going to be talking about how to implement collections as classes, both with arrays and with linked lists. And that's also going to be the theme of your fifth homework assignment that'll be due next week. Okay? So let's go to our slides. Remember this? Last Monday we wrote a class named Array Stack, where we used an internal structure of an array of ints, but then externally the class was presenting itself as a stack, and if you push elements in the stack, it would add them to the end of the array, and if you pop them off, it would take the element that was last in the array. So we maintain the array and the size and the capacity, which is the overall length of the array. Um, so yeah, I want to go back to that class and add a couple of features to it today. And we've also been learning about how to write linked lists. And we've been writing these functions where you pass in a front of a list and you do something to the list. But that's not really how linked lists are usually used by a client. More likely it would be something like this, where you construct a linked list object and you call add or remove or whatever on it. And so that's a slightly different style than what we have been doing. So I want to talk about how you would change our code to be in that style. So that's the plan for, for now. Um, so let's go back to that array stack. Let me just open that code with you guys. I have a Qt Creator project. The main code could say things like this, you know, make an array stack and, uh, you know, add some elements by calling push. So push some ints and then print the two string of the stack. And so the code we wrote will, um, that's kind of a small font. You can push things onto the stack and then you'll see the stack get bigger. Okay, so that's not too shocking. The bottom is on the left and the top is on the right. And then when you pop things off the stack or peek at them, it'll give you the last element or the top element from, from the stack. That's what we wrote last week, okay? Yeah? So let's learn about a few other things you can do. I want to talk about the word const. You may have seen this pop up occasionally in assignments or starter codes or lecture codes or whatever. We haven't really talked about it. Const just means constant, something that cannot be changed. In Java, there's a keyword called final that has the same meaning. JavaScript, I think, has a const keyword. Um, Python, if you learned Python, does not have any const concept. But anyway, most languages have a concept of this where you can say, this value doesn't change. So there's a couple different ways you can use const. You can use it when you're declaring a variable or a parameter, like the first example there. If you pass something that's const, it means the call cannot change it. Now, you don't need to use const if you're passing something simple like an int, because it doesn't really, you know, if you change the int, it doesn't really matter. But if you're passing something like an object, like a bank account or a stack, or you guys have written a lot of methods where you pass in a vector or a grid or something like this. Now, some of those methods are, are supposed to modify the vector, modify the grid, but some of them aren't. And if the method isn't going to modify the thing, it's good practice to declare it as being constant. The reason it's good to do that is because it kind of tells anybody looking at the code, like, this method is not going to change this thing. And if you declare something constant, like their const bank account, 
if the code <coughs> of that method foo, fun function foo, tries to change the state of the object, it will not compile. So if the bank account class has like a deposit method that changes the balance of the account, it won't allow you to call the deposit method inside of the foo function. So that's cool. It helps catch potential errors where you might be modifying an object unintentionally. That's cool. Um, there's another context in which you can use the word const. That is, if you are writing a class, you can declare that one of your methods is a const method. And you actually write it as const at the end of the method. And what that means is you're saying this method, I promise if you call this method on me, I won't change the state of myself. If I'm a bank account and you call get balance on me, that won't change anything about the account's internal state. It will stay constant. Okay? And actually, those two uses of the word const are related because the first one only lets you call methods from the second one. So like, if you have a parameter that's const, it will only allow you to call methods that are declared as being const on it. So uh, it's good practice when you're writing a class to look at all your methods and figure out which ones don't change the object state and write the word const at the end of them. So if you look at our array stack that we wrote, we have a file called arraystack.h here. We have a push method. We have a pop method, a peak method. We have is empty and to string. Which of these methods are const or should be const? What's one? Peak? Right, you can't put const on push or pop because the whole point of those methods is to modify the state of the stack, right? Any others? I think is empty and to string are also ones that, you know, you can call to string a hundred times, it doesn't modify what's in the stack, right? Now, uh, small detail, if you declare your methods, this is in the .h file, uh, array stack .h. If you declare your method as being const, then you also have to go to the .cpp file and you have to go down to the same method here and you have to put const there as well. If you forget in one place or the other, you'll get that lovely error about a symbol not defined for architecture x86 underscore 64, and then you'll get stuck and confused on that. So anyway, if you add const to your, to your methods, it doesn't really do anything visible to the client, but it's good practice to do it. It also, you know, it helps avoid, like if the client of the stack, like here's the stack client. If I say uh, void foo array stack reference stack, if I try to say stack dot push 42, you know, lol, it's not constant after all, then it should give me an error. Oops, it didn't. <laughs> I think it's because I need to um, rebuild the project. I need to clean it and rebuild it. Because if you change a method to being constant, it doesn't always notice right away. I think that's what's going on. Oh, no, wait, wait, sorry. I'm, I'm stupid. Uh, the reason it's supposed to object to that is if you were to say const here, then it wouldn't want to let you modify the stack. So that's why it didn't complain. I was expecting a compiler error. Now that I've added the word const, 45 minutes from now when it's done compiling, we'll see an error uh, <laughs> if it finishes by then. Um, anyway, you can't call push because the parameter is declared as const. Oh, I think I saw it there. The error is a little bit confusing. It says passing const stack as argument discards qualifiers. Whatever, it just means that you can't call that method on a const stack. If I were to remove const, then the code would compile, but now it doesn't, okay? But by contrast, I could call stack.peak, I could call stack.isEmpty, and that compiles just fine, okay? So if I ask you to write a class, I might say, I want you to make methods const as appropriate. That means if they don't modify the state of the object, put the word const at the end of the method head, okay? So that's const. Any questions about const? Um, sorry, so what modifications do we need to make to uh, prototypes if we make uh, a function const? Do we need a path? We don't, we just have to make all the parameters const, or does the const uh, so, thing right there handle it? The yeah, what, what modifications do you need to make? Um, so remember, when we're writing a class, there's kind of two sides to that. There's like you write the class, and then there's also client code that uses the class. Sometimes you write both of those pieces of code. Sometimes different people write them. For example, the Stanford Library. We wrote vector.h. You are using vector.h as a client. So you're asking me what modifications need to be made. It depends if you're the client or the author of the class or both. If you're the author of the class, you do that. If you're the client of the class, you might be choosing to do that 
but that's more dependent on your client program and what your program is doing. If I'm using the stack in a way that isn't modifying it, I might want to say const on my heading there. Okay, well, I'm just kind of surveying, showing you some other features of classes that, that are, are relevant. Yes? If we had not put const, um, when we go into like the class area, um, and we put const by, if we had not done that query, then would that code still work? Or would it get added? Oh, so if this had not said const on is empty, yeah. and then also here not, and then here, if I tried to call it, yeah. it shouldn't compile. Even though we could look at the code and we could see that is empty doesn't modify the state of the object, the fact that the method doesn't say const, the compiler doesn't trust us, it won't compile the code. So I'm going to put it back, but yeah. It's not so much whether you modify, it's whether you say that you've modified. And then of course, if we said const but we're lying, like in here we tried to do like size plus plus or something, that shouldn't work either. It won't let us. So you can't say const and then lie about it. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's cover some other stuff. Um, here's an interesting C++ feature. It's called operator overloading. This is either the coolest or the worst feature ever, depending on the kind of person that you are. Uh, operator overloading is redefining or adding meanings to the built-in operators of the language. So like, um, you can define what the plus operator means when used on your class. Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but if you have a vector, you can use operators like plus equals on it. Have you ever seen that? Uh, I haven't talked about it very much, but like over here, if I include vector.h, vector.h, if I make a vector and I go like, you know, vector of strings v, and you normally would say like v.add, you know, marty, you do like that, right? But you can also write v plus equals marty. That's weird. It lets you do that. It compiles, it runs, it behaves the same way as add. And so the reason that works, like I'm taking a vector plus a string. In a language like Java, that wouldn't make any sense. That would be a compiler error. In C++, you can do this thing called operator overloading. You can basically tell the compiler, hey, if you're using this operator with these data types, here's what you should do. Here's what that should turn into. And that's, uh, that's operator overloading. And the syntax of it is you basically write a function describing the operator. But the name of the function is like operator plus or operator times or operator equals or whatever. It's the word operator followed by the actual characters of the operator. And then you have parameters and you fill in the body of what it should do. Um, it's a little confusing because like if you say operator plus to a to b, that really means that you can now say a plus b. It doesn't have a plus before both of them. But this is the way you sort of write it down as if the function's name were plus or something. Okay. So look. You can do all kinds of weird stuff with this feature. Uh, I personally think it's a bad feature because it makes it so that like any given statement with any given operator could just do some random thing that they <laughs> overloaded it to do. I think it's kind of dangerous, but uh, the guidelines of the language, they say that you should only overload operators if the meaning is obvious. So like if you're taking, uh, you know, two bank accounts and you do a minus operator between them, it doesn't really make sense what would that do, you know, <laughs> so don't do that. Um, <laughs> But a really common use of the operator is to make an object printable. So there's, a, there's an operator you can overload to do this. Now, um, look at our array stack. I'm going to delete this vector for a minute. If you have an array stack and you want to see what's in it, we have this method called toString, right? OK, well, what if I just wrote C out stack? That's what you can do with a vector. That's what you can do with a map, right? You can just say C out my vector, and it'll print it. It actually doesn't let you do that because C++ doesn't know how to print an array stack. Now you might say, well, but it's obvious. You print it by calling to string on it. Well, C++ doesn't understand that that's how you print a stack. You have to tell it. So the way you tell C++ how to print something is you actually overload this less than less than operator. And so that looks like this. You write an operator called operator less than less than. The parameters are a little bit confusing. It takes an output stream reference, O stream, that output stream is like C out or a file out. Those are all O stream objects. And it also takes your value that you want to print. Those are the two parameters that it takes. So basically, you just print the thing out to that stream, and then you have to also return the output stream. Um, the reason you have to return the output stream is so that you can chain together multiple less than less thans on one line. It's kind of a subtlety. But look, this is the style that you have to use to write this operator. This is the exact heading that it has to have. So if you want to make your array stack printable, 
Boy, a lot of people coughing and sneezing today. I hope everybody's uh, feeling well. Don't, no hugs after class. I'm calling no hug with me policy. You can hug each other, not me. Um, so if you want your object printable, what you do is you come down here. This is, this is in the um, array stack dot uh, h. You go down to the bottom of your class, underneath the class. It's actually not inside the class. And you say, o stream reference operator less than less than, which takes an o stream reference, which I'll call out, and it takes an array stack reference called stack. So you're saying, you're declaring, I'm going to implement this overload for this operator. You always declare things in an h file with a semicolon. Then in the array stack.cpp somewhere, you write that same operator but with curly braces and you actually write the body of how to do it. So how do you do it? Well, just pretend that you're printing the stack. How would you print the stack? Well, I mean, over here in the client, we said, you know, see out uh, stack dot to string, right? So you just do that. So you can just come over here and say see out stack dot to string endl. There's a couple things wrong. This is pretty much the idea. You just include the code of how to print the thing. But there's two things that are wrong with this. One is you're not supposed to include the endl because the person printing the stack might not want an endl. You should let them decide if they should print an endl. So I'm going to delete that part. The other part you should change is this operator can be used to print a C out and it can be used to print a files and any other kind of output stream. So really this parameter called out is the thing that you're printing the thing to. So you just say out. That means this parameter here. Whatever the output stream is that you're printing me to, send my two string to that stream. So you compile this. Now remember, the original thing didn't support uh, calling just print with stack here. But now I compile and, oh wait, uh, I have an error that says I didn't return anything. So back here, after you print the out stack to string, you have to say return out. Return the, you return the same output stream that was passed to you. That's always what you do. So basically every operator less than less than looks about like this. It's usually just a line or two of code. I compile this and I go back to the main program and now it compiled. It allowed me to print the stack like that. And I print it and I get the same output where it, it prints the stack like this. Now if you don't believe it because the output didn't change, I'll try to convince you. So first of all, I'm going to remove all the things that say two string. So it's supposedly calling our operator in the main client here. But I'm also going to go to the array stack and I'm going to change it to say uh, boo yeah, something like that. What's up? So I'm just going to put some silly stuff on the sides of the string. And then when I run it, it is going to print those messages on the sides. So basically this was printed to the output string, whatever. So it's calling the operator that we wrote. So that's how to make an object printable. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I mean, in a lot of languages, like how do you make something printable in Java? You know, what method do you have to write? Bless you. Yeah? Well, system out print line is how you print things, but if you say print line and you pass an object of type bank account, it usually just prints some kind of gibberish. How do you make it so that print line on a bank account prints something meaningful? What do you have to write in the bank account class? Yeah. Uh, yeah, two string method. Is that what you're going to say too, sir? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, a two string method. So actually, this two string that we wrote, if you had just written that, Java would automatically know how to print objects of your type. C++, if you want to make things printable, you have to write this. In fact, you don't even have to write a toString method. ToString is not a special method in C++. So the fact that we had it was just because I thought that might be more familiar to you guys because a lot of you come from Java. But this method is not special. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to write one of these operators on, the, um, on homework five. So does, does this general syntax seem okay to you? I mean, it's a little weird looking, but basically copy and paste it, change array stack to your type, and then do the equivalent of this or whatever, and then you're good. Any other questions? Okay, that's how to make objects printable. Uh, let's see, what's next? I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, here. Okay, I wanna talk about something called a destructor. A destructor is the opposite of a constructor. You know what a constructor does? A constructor is code that runs when an object is being created. It's being born. Destructor is code that runs when an object dies. 
when the object falls out of scope and is being cleaned up, thrown out. If you write this special method, whose name is a tilde followed by the name of your class, then it will run that method on your object as your object is being deleted, right before it gets deleted. Why would you want to write something like this? Well, the main reason that you would ever want to do this is if your class allocates memory using new, allocates um, pointer memory using the word new, then remember how that kind of memory does not get cleaned up automatically in C++. If you want that memory to be cleaned up, you have to clean it up yourself by saying the word delete. And so this is a place where you would do that deleting. So let me show you an example. This array stack that we have written, if I go to array stack dot um, CPP, uh, up here when we create the array stack, we make a new array of 10 ints. The way that currently the program is written, the array stack has a memory leak. If you create a stack and then get rid of it, those 10 ints are just sitting in the memory and can never be used again until the program quits. So that's bad. It's hard for me to demonstrate that to you guys. What I would have to do is run a loop that, because 10 ints aren't that much memory, so I'd have to run a loop that made a million stacks and you'd have to see the memory usage go up. And it, I'm not gonna spend the time to do that. I want you to just take me at my word on that. And 10 ints isn't the worst thing in the world to, to lose track of, but if you had a program that ran for days and days, this would be a problem. So um, we need to clean this memory up. So the way you do it is in your h file, your array stack.h, you come up here and then you write a method called same name as the constructor, but with a tilde. So this is a destructor. Okay. And now in the .cpp file, the way you implement it is you have to say the class name with colon colon in the front, just like every other member when you're implementing the body. Now here, you just write what code you want to run as the stack is being destroyed. And so for a minute, I won't put anything yet, but here's what I'll do. I'll just do C out, Con, uh, destructor was called, okay? Endle. So let's just see if, if it works, we'll see that print out. Um, so if I run the program, we will see, it prints all the normal output as usual, but then it calls, it says destructor was called. So I don't think that's super helpful. I mean, it, it, I guess it showed you that this thing got run, but it's not totally clear. I don't think this totally illustrates what's going on here. So let me try to make it a little more clear. If I go to the client program, stack client, all the code that plays with the stack is in uh, main, right? So let's change the code just slightly. Let me grab this code and let me make a new method called void uh, example. And I'm gonna put this code here, okay? Just pasted everything from main into this other function. And I'm gonna have main, I'm gonna put some print statements here. See out main begins, okay? And then I'm gonna say main ends. I'm also gonna do the same thing for this other method. I'm gonna say example begins and example ends, okay? Just wanna see the flow of what happens in this program. Uh, example begins, example ends. So I guess my point is this stack gets created in the example function. It should get cleaned up and destructed at the end of the example function. So if I run the program now, main begins, main ends. What? Did I not call it? <laughs> they should make me take my own midterm. And if I can't get at least a 50, they should just boot me the heck out of here, shouldn't they? Um, oh, well, yeah, thank you. I appreciate your help. I didn't remember to call my function. Okay, what do we got? Up at the top, we got main begins, then main calls example. Example begins, it prints a bunch of output about stacks. Then it says example ends. Destructor was called because we're exiting example, we're cleaning up the stack. Now after that, main ends. So as we're exiting the example function, it destructs that stack, it's going out of scope. Okay, so look, we haven't finished yet because a destructor isn't just supposed to print something, it's supposed to clean up this memory. It's supposed to clean up this memory that we allocated up here. So you just basically need to say delete elements. That's the only piece of memory that we need to clean up. We also have a size and a capacity. Some students ask, like, don't I need to delete those as well? No, you only need to delete memory that you use new. If you don't use new, the compiler will automatically manage the memory for you. That's the whole point. That's why we didn't use new until now. But the array, we did use new, we have to use delete. 
Um, a small thing, if you're deleting an array, you have to say delete bracket bracket. <laughs> it needs to know that you're deleting an array. Any other thing that isn't an array, you just say delete. Sorry, that's a little subtlety of the, of the syntax. That's it. That's a complete implementation of the destructor. If there were any other pointers that were new memory, we'd have to delete those as well. Okay. So what do you think? You have questions about destructor, what it does, what should be put in a destructor? Any questions about this? Yeah. Sorry, because the array what? Is the only thing we explicitly allocate memory for? Is the only thing we include in our constructor? Yeah, um, because the array is the only thing that we said new, that means it's the only thing we need to explicitly clean up. New and delete are kind of pairs. You should almost always have one new for every delete. You know what I mean? Like, if you newed it, you need to delete it. If you didn't do it, you don't need to delete it. New means I want to manage this. I want to take care of this memory and its lifespan. That also means when that life spans over, I will clean up after myself. I will delete it. Any other questions? OK. Let's move on. So I want to talk about a class for a linked list. We've been playing with a class for a stack. I just want to, that, that was ta talking about two things, right? The class for the stack was talking about class concepts. And I was talking about arrays, implementing collections using arrays. So now I want to implement a collection using a linked list. And we already implemented a bunch of linked list type functionality. We learned about nodes and pointers and next and data and looping current dot next, all that. We did a bunch of good stuff. But the way that we wrote it was what I would call a procedural style. All of it was just a bunch of functions that took a linked list front pointer as a parameter. So if you don't remember those functions, I'll just open the file that we worked on before. It's a code from last uh, week, last Friday. So we made a client of code. Actually, wait, let me set up because I'm going to run this one. So I'm going to change this to be like main stack so it doesn't run that one. I'm going to go back to this linked list file. This is the code we wrote before. So we wrote all these methods. Remember this? All these functions. And they all take the front of the list as a parameter. And then in main, I'm going to change this to be just named main now. You say like, well, let's make a list that's a front and you add things to it and you can print it and you can add first, add last. You, can, you know, we, we, we called these functions from main like this, okay? Now, I don't like this code. This is not the way you would normally do this. I did it this way with you guys because we're just learning. This is the simplest way I can show this to you. I'm trying to clear out any unwanted concepts so we can focus on that pointer and linked list stuff because that stuff is hard. But... Really, if you want to use a linked list, you don't want to be dealing with all these pointers and star and new and null and all that stuff. Um, you just want to talk to some friendly object that kind of wraps all that up for you. And look, what is an object really? It's data combined with behavior. <laughs> it's variables combined with functions. It's data and behavior together. That's what an object is. That's what objects are useful for. So when it comes to a collection, when it comes to a linked list, if you look at the data we're storing in these nodes and the functions we're using to process the nodes, let's just put the chocolate and the peanut butter together. Dip it one in the other, we got something even better, right? We gotta have a linked list class. And we don't have to pass front, 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 front as a parameter to all these functions. Instead, where's the front gonna be? How do you, if, if I delete the parameter of front from all these functions, how will my code know where the front of the linked list is? Yes, sir. I'm going to make that into a member variable, a private variable inside of the linked list class. It will keep track of the front, and it will have all these functions you can call that will start at that front. So that's what we're going to do. So instead of this style, I'm going to make a file called linkedintlist.cpp. I'm not going to start from scratch because it's a lot of typing, but we'll walk through some parts of it. Okay? So you'll make a class called, oops, where am I? I want the h file. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, there, okay, I want the H file. There. So you'll make a class called linked int list that has all these, these are basically the same functions we had in the other file, but they don't take front, 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 front as a parameter. They otherwise take the same parameters, right? But no front. Where's front? Front is here. The front is the private, that's what you just said. The front as the private member variable. 
So like if you're going to write a constructor for a list, the constructor initializes the private data of the class. What is the initial state of a list when you first made it? I guess I'm asking what should I set the front to be when a linked in list is being created? I really feel that I'm reaching you today. <laughs> we're really clicking, we're connecting. It's like a big group hug, but without all the legal implications. <laughs> um, what should the front be when you first make a linked list object? What do you think? It should be null, because there are no elements yet, there's no data, so the front should be null. So in this constructor, I will initialize the front to be null. But then when you add things, look at the code for add. This is the same code that we wrote for add. This is adding to the back of the list. If the front's null, make the front be a new node. If the front isn't null, make a current, walk to the end, and then attach the new node to its next. We wrote this code. That's why I'm not writing it now with you. We already wrote it. The only difference is I changed the heading to say link list add instead of just void add, and I deleted the parameter of front because front is known to the whole file. It's the private member variable. And all of these functions have that same style to them. One interesting difference is that in the code we wrote before, we had to think about this like reference to a pointer business, you know? Remember that? If we're modifying the list, we have to pass a reference to a pointer. The interesting thing about this new style is we don't have to worry about that issue if we're doing it this way because you always have sort of the direct access to that pointer. And if you need to change it, you just can. So I don't have to worry about references to pointers in this particular style of coding. So like if I were gonna take a method like add front and I wanted to move that over, I would just come over to the code we already wrote. I guess we called it add first over here, but I would just take this exact code and I would just copy and paste it over and it would just work because this thing's called front and it's the same name that the parameter front used to be called. So I wouldn't even have to modify the code at all basically. So I'm not gonna sit here and copy and paste and copy and paste and copy and paste, but that would be all we would need to do. The bulk of the work would just be like writing out this, um, this header, this .h file to have all the functions we need and then coming over and filling in the bodies by pasting them from the code we wrote last week. Um, one thing I don't have in here, oh, I guess I do, is um, which methods should be const. So like asking if the list is empty, that's const. Asking for the size of the list, that's const. But adding, removing, et cetera, those things are not const, okay? So look, the, the whole point of that, the, the reason you would want to convert over to this style, you might say, what's the benefit of doing this? Seems like a bunch of stuff I don't like all put together. You said it was chocolate and peanut butter, Marty, but this is like broccoli and pickles. I don't like either, whatever. I don't know, pick your favorite two bad foods. Like, why are you combining the, I don't like classes, they're weird, syntax sucks, and I don't like this pointer and linked list stuff either. Why are you taking all the stuff I hate and putting it all together? Um, well, you're thinking of things from one side, like, this version, where the linked list is a class, is much easier to use by a client. So I'm bundling up all the linked list stuff we had to think hard about, adding front and pointers and references to pointers and all that, loops over linked lists and null and all this. I'm bundling all that up in here in this class, and then the client doesn't have to think about any of that. What does the client code look like? If you have this, it looks more like the following. You say, LinkedIn list, my list, add 42, add negative three, add to the front, this, print the dot size, remove the front. Rem it, this is much cleaner, much better. The person who uses this doesn't have to know anything about pointers. There's no stars on the whole screen. Do you see this? The person implementing the class has to understand pointers, but not the client. So that's the benefit. I once heard an analogy from my mentor, Stuart Regis. He said, the linked list nodes are like little paint cans and the, um, you know, you're painting a, a house or building or whatever. And the link list object, the class, is like sort of the painting company or contractors or whatever. It's like, if you're trying to get your house painted, you don't want to be picking up all the paint cans and moving the paint cans yourself. You just want to talk to the painting company. Hey, can you paint my house blue? And they just take care of it. They deal with all the paint cans and which paint goes where and how many paint cans do we need. They're dealing with all the nitty gritty details. 
and we don't have to as a client. And I know you guys appreciate this because that's what you're doing every time that you use a vector, every time you use a map or a set or a stack or a queue. A lot of those collections have pointers and nodes and shit going on inside of there, and you didn't have to think about that at all. So that's the whole point of classes, is to shield the client of the class from the details of how the behavior of the class is implemented. So, ta-da, we have a linked list class after all this. And the front is its private data. Uh, one thing I haven't done here is I haven't talked about if you were to write a destructor for a linked list, you're supposed to free up all the memory. So what memory do you think I need to free up? Do I need to free up any memory? If so, what memory is that and how do I free it up? Do you think? Can you free up all, like, the pointers in the linked list? all the pointers, all the nodes. I got this chain of nodes. I got three of them here. I got to free up all three of those nodes. So let me tell you some things that would not be adequate. One thing that would not be adequate would be to say, oh, I got to empty out the list. Okay, front equals null pointer. That will sort of empty the list. It's equivalent of taking the scissors and cutting this, this pointer right here, right? But that does not do the whole purpose of the destructor, which is to free up all those nodes. Another thing that would not be adequate would be to say, oh, 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 okay, that's not what he wants. He wants delete front. Delete is how you free up memory. What's wrong with this? This is better, but what's wrong with this? Saying delete front. Yes? You say it just deletes the pointer. That's not quite right because when you say delete, you pass a pointer as the argument to delete. It goes to the object pointed at by the pointer and it frees up that object's memory. So it will go to this node and it will free up that memory. But what's wrong? I mean, somebody had it called. Uh, did you have your hand up? Yeah, the other pointers. The other uh, nodes are still. It doesn't delete all the rest of the nodes. There's no like cascade automatically here. Just because you delete front and front points to other things doesn't mean it goes and you know dominoes all the other ones and deletes them too. I would need to write a loop that loops across the list, deleting each node to really clean this up. And I'm not going to write that code right now because I want you to write that code. <laughs> but that's what you need to do. Okay. So. I guess, I guess this is not hypothetical stuff. I'm going to make you guys on homework five implement collections as classes, some of which have arrays for the data and some of which have nodes for the data. So you will have to do essentially this kind of stuff. So I want to answer any question you may have about doing so. Yeah. How do you implement like the for each loop uh, like syntax for the client? Oh, how do you implement a for each loop? Yeah, so for starters, I can't use that in here right now. It won't work. If you want to implement a for each loop, you have to learn about something called an iterator. If you're curious, I would Google for C++ STL iterator. It's a little too complicated for me to want to show it to you today. There's a couple of extra methods you have to add. And if you have those methods, C++ will notice, and it'll allow for each loops on your, on your code. You basically have to explain to C++ how to iterate across the contents of the collection. It's not super hard, but it takes more time than I'll have today to talk about. Yeah? Can we implement destructors for structs? Can you have a destructor in a struct? Yeah, you can if the struct has pointer fields inside of it. But in general, we, we don't do that as often. Structs are usually very small. Even a struct like a list node, it doesn't, like you, you could imagine the destructor for a list node automatically going to next and deleting them too. The reason we don't do that is because sometimes you pull out a node and you want to just get rid of them and then oops, they boom, 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 boom and they kill a bunch of other nodes on the way and you know, no, no, don't. You don't want to blow them all up. So we mostly handle this at this level in the class rather than in the list node struct. Do you guys have any other questions about the, I just kind of shrapneled a whole bunch of random shit at you today. I'm just trying to fill up all the loose ends of what you need to know to implement these collection classes. Any other question about that? Yes? Um, you about the friend keyword? Uh, oh, the friend keyword. Yeah, um, I, I didn't mention that yet. Um, there's a keyword called friend. I very briefly mentioned this once. If you declare this overloaded, this is that same operator to print out a list, you know? If you declare that operator using the word friend, 
it means that the operator is allowed to see the private variables of the list. So if I go to the implementation of that operator, you'll see that it refers to the front of the list, list.front. It's allowed to do that because it's friends with the class. If it were not, it wouldn't be allowed to see it. Now you might say, wait a minute, Marty, you didn't talk about friend when you did the array stack. And that's because in the array stack, the operator didn't need to look at anything private. It just called the public to string method to get the output. If I had individually wanted to look at the array of elements, I would have wanted to make this one a friend as well. On the assignment that I'll give you, I'll declare all the .h headings for you, and I'll put friend in there for you so it'll let you look at private stuff. We talked about it's sort of a friends with benefits kind of a keyword, right? Uh, look at each other's private things. Um, yeah. It's kind of a FMOTQ version of friendship, you might say. I don't know, what do you do? Isn't that, isn't that some kind of make-out session? Any, any other questions about the classes? One time I was walking home from work and I accidentally kind of walked right past where that was happening and I like narrowly avoided the gravitational pull of FMOTQ and I was like, oh man, that would have been a scandal. Like, if I'd accidentally walked through, hey, what's everybody doing? Ah. Um, I got a little more stuff I want to show you before we're done. I want to talk about something now. I want to talk about a particular collection type it's called a priority queue. And you might say, what the heck? How can you possibly be introducing this to me in 10 minutes? And I think the idea is, I'm not gonna try to help you master this in 10 minutes. The idea is I want you, you're gonna go and think about this for your assignment. And so I'm gonna sort of seed and introduce this concept to you, and you need to take it from there. So it's intentional that this is brief. There are certain tasks that you might work on where you want prioritization. You have a printer. And normally the print jobs are printed in the order that they come in, except certain people are more important. If a professor prints a job, it cuts in line in front of all the students or something like that. You might have an emergency room that has a queue of patients that need to be processed. They're, they're in pain, they're, they're sick, they're hurting, they need help. But, you know, so in general you process people first come, first serve. But if somebody more important shows up, they're bleeding, they're urgently in critical condition, you cut them in line in front of people who just have the sniffles or whatever. So prioritization is important. If you were going to model these things in code, you would want some concept of prioritization. It's basically a queue with urgency, with priority. So the operations this magical queue would be nice to have would be the ability to add a new person to the line and the ability to pluck out the most urgent person from the line so that you could process them. You're sort of always handling the most urgent person in the list, in the line. If you want to do this, there is an ADT, there's a data type, there's a collection type that's for you. It's called a priority queue. Priority queue has the following operations. You can enqueue. Think of it, start out like a normal queue. You can enqueue, you can dequeue, you can peak. Except when you enqueue, you pass in a priority level. Somewhat unintuitively, the lower priority levels are more urgent. The intuition there is like priority one means super important kind of thing. Priority two might be less important. So you add elements with priorities. Then the queue stores them somehow. I just wrote it, drew it as a blob. Stores all these pieces of data. Then you dequeue things out, and it'll dequeue out the most urgent one, along with the lowest priority. So in this example, the number two has the lowest, so it'll exit out the word if for you. Okay? So that is a thing that exists. You, this collection exists. It's in our libraries. You can even use it. It's called pq.h. What was your question? Yeah. If you pass in two that have the same priority, usually it breaks ties by the one that arrived first. Yeah. So here's the priority queue class. My slide got a little cut off, but you can make a priority queue of whatever type. You can enqueue elements with a priority, and then you can call dequeue, and the one with the lowest, most urgent number as its priority will come out. So Eric would come out before Marty. If I added another one with priority of three, that one would come out second after Eric, and so on. It's not super complicated to understand this structure, I don't think, if you've already used other ADTs like queues and maps and these kinds of things. So I'm not expecting that this would be super hard to, for you to, to understand, and I hope I've explained some context where you would want something like this. Um, the real question is, if you had to implement this thing, if you had to make a class, if this thing didn't exist already, and you had to write it from scratch, how would you implement it internally? How would you store the data for this thing? That's literally what your homework assignment is. I want you to implement something like this two different ways. So let's quickly talk about some ways that you could implement this thing. You could store it in an array or a vector, like we did with our stack. You could either have the elements be unsorted or sorted. 
if they were unsorted, what you could do is you could uh, NQ by just adding to the end. Regardless of priority, just put it at the end. You could DQ by looping across the thing, looking for the one with the lowest priority and returning that one. Removing and returning that one. So if that's your structure, adding is fast and removing is slow, right? What if instead you store it sorted by priority? When new patients come in, you stick them in the right spot to be in sorted order. When patients come out, who comes out? Which element? If it's sorted. If the PQ is sorted, the lowest index. The lowest index. Thank you. The start of the, of the array is the one that would come out. It's always the one at the start. You see that? So those are two ways you could implement this. as an unsorted or sorted array slash vector. You could also use a linked list, unsorted or sorted. If it's unsorted, you just add them to the front or end or wherever. If it's sorted, you have to loop over and find the right spot and insert them at the right spot to maintain sorted order, right? Which one of these is better? Well, I mean, it kind of depends what you're optimizing for. But I hope you'll see that all four, unsorted, sorted, array, linked list, all four of those combinations, they all have certain operations that are really slow. <coughs> They all have some operations where you have to loop across the whole list looking for stuff, loop across elements to shift them, right? We talk about that as being big O of N, because you might have to look at all N of the contents of the vector, right? So these structures all have their drawbacks. Well, look, there's an answer that's better than any of these, and it's a special structure called a heap. A heap is simply an array that you use in a particular way. If you're using a heap, you think of each element as having parents and children. Parents are at half your index, children are at double your index, and double your index plus one. This is just a concept, just an idea. Why do you think of this this way? Because <clears throat> if you keep the array sorted, quote unquote, such that parents are more urgent than their children, this structure will be very efficient for building a priority queue. How do you do that? When you add something to the PQ, you put it at the end, but now it's out of order because it's got priority one. It should be closer to the start, right? It's out of order. So what do you do? You swap, swap, swap it up with its parent until it is in order. Seven's parent is three. It's got a more urgent priority than three, so you swap it. Three's parent is one. It's got a more urgent priority than one, so you swap it. You swap, swap, swap with index over two, index over two, index over two, until it gets to the right place in sorted order with respect to those parents. Similarly, if you're removing, you take the first element out, you swap the last element up, now it's out of order, so you bubble it down with child, 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 times two, times two, times two, until it's in the right order. This all sounds like a bunch of complicated mumbo jumbo, but if you implement this behavior, what you will find is that adding and removing from this structure all have a big O of log n runtime. Because if you're jumping by times two times two, if you're jumping by divided by two divided by two, those are log base two of the input size n. So this is a very nice balanced runtime for the core operations of this thing. And it also has the nice property that the most urgent element, the one that needs to come out first, the one that you would want to peek at or remove, is where? Where is it located? What index? At the start, the lowest index, in this case, that's index one. So this is a really clever little trick to implement this particular structure. <laughs> yes, sir. Does this have anything to do with the heap mixed stack? The heap what? The heap allocator. It is not, it's not the same as the CS107 assignment of doom called heap allocator. That's a different thing. Don't worry, I won't make you implement that. What you're going to have to do for this homework is I want you to implement a priority queue using two styles, or three styles. One, using an unsorted array. So that's this first thing, unsorted array. The second style is a sorted linked list, the bottom one here. And the third is using this weird parent-child vertical ordered heap structure. I know I blitzed through that really fast. That's because it's all in the spec in lots of detail. And I want you to think about it and read about it and work on it after your exam. That's all for today. I'll see you Wednesday.